Ruby and Kevin, that you will uplift her and help her and give her your peace and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Whenever I hear the word glory, I think of the South Sydney Football Club song. Glory, glory to South Sydney. Glory, glory to South Sydney. But I also associate it with the Salvation Army. Because when I was a child, the Salvation Army used to come down our street and form a circle and have a service on a Sunday night. And they would play their, their trombones, their tubers, their cornets, and the, and, and, and the, and the women would uh, ring their uh, tambourines and uh, they would sing uh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And they'd have testimonies. And then they'd march off to the citadel and we'd all follow them. And you know, in the Salvation Army, when someone passes away, they don't have death notices. They have promoted to glory notices. So that when someone dies, they are promoted to glory. Isn't that great? And um, our passage this morning from Romans focuses upon glory. In verse 18 it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. What is the glory that will be revealed in us or to us? Uh, to us seems a better translation as it takes into account the glory that will be revealed when Jesus returns. Imagine that you're in a, a theatre. You're all anticipating a production, a, a musical production, which is light, which is bright, and you've been told they're going to have a great light show in the production. And you're waiting for the curtains to open. But you can already see underneath the curtains, at the edge, some light. And then at 8 o'clock, the curtains open and the light is revealed and you see it in all its majesty. Well, that's what we're like at the moment. We can see some of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he comes again, the curtains will be taken away and we will see the glory of of Jesus in all his majesty and power. In Matthew 24 it says, all peoples of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great glory. Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious Rome. And again in 1 Thessalonians it says those who reject God will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and his glorious strength. And set Titus it says there we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. And that wonderful passage from Philippians. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. In heaven and on earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The greatest day in the history of the world. The coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ is a day of glory. And then in heaven, we're given a glimpse in the book of Revelation. And in heaven, there's going to be glory. Revelation chapter 5 says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth 
and under the earth, on the sea, and everything in the sea, say blessing and honour, glory and power to the one who is seated on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. And in the heavenly city, there will be no need of the sun because the glory of God will illuminate it. Here is the future glory, the glory to be revealed to us at the end of time. And we will all see the King of glory. During his earthly life, the disciples glimpsed some of the glory of Jesus at his baptism, at the transfiguration, at the resurrection, when Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Peter wrote years later, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty for he received honour and glory from God when the voice from heaven, from the majestic glory said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And John, reflecting on the life of Jesus said, for we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory encompass grace and truth. And summed up in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 when it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. What a wonderful picture we have of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see it all by faith at the moment. But one day, that glory will be revealed to us. But that's not the only glory that we will see or experience. God's plan for each one of you is to glorify you so that you become like the Lord Jesus Christ. We will have glorified bodies. No aches or pains, no pills, no wrinkles. We will have glorified hearts. We will have glorified minds. In Romans chapter 8, it says, And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Paul says later in Philippians, he will transform our lowly bodies into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. And John, in his letter, said, we know that when he appears... We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Brothers and sisters, that is your future. That is your hope. That is what God is doing in your lives now, preparing you for that glory that lies ahead. And Jude sums it up in the chorus that most of you know and have sung many times. Now unto him who is able to keep, keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory without blemish and with exceeding joy to the only God, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Lord, belongs majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forever. God's plan is to present you faultless and without blemish in his presence. There is a picture of your destiny. 
your future glory, your graduation day. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? And it starts all here on earth. For every day we're progressing from glory to glory. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, Paul says, We are looking as into a mirror at the glory of the Lord and we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Every day as we look to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is changing us, changing us from, from sinners who fall short of his glory into people who are filled with his glory. In the book of Romans, Paul talks about justification, where we are made right with God. He talks about sanctification, being made holy, a process that goes on in our life day by day. And then he talks about glorification. And it all comes about because of what Jesus has done for us and is doing in us through his spirit. And a large part of church, of why we meet together as Christians, is to learn more of the glory of Jesus so that we can become more like him. When the church first met after Pentecost, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Because through hearing God's word, through the Lord's Supper and sharing his body and blood, through fellowship together and through prayer, we grow to be more like Christ. And Hebrews, it says, don't neglect gathering together. Encourage one another all the more as you see the day coming. Church is a place of encouragement, not discouragement. Play, church is a place of lift up, not put down. Church is a place of building up, not tearing down. And we pray for each other. Listen to how Paul prayed for Christians in Ephesus. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory and the inheritance of for his saints. Now that's the way Paul prays for Ephesians. And it's a, it's, a, it's a pattern for us to pray for one another. As we move from glory to glory. And that's one of the reasons why we gather together at church. To encourage each other on the road to glory. But there's more. There's the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glory that will come to us, but there's glory for nature. Romans 8, 19. The creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. 
Now the greenies and the climate alarmists are onto something. The climate isn't as it should be. The environment isn't as good as it should be. And in saying that, they are agreeing with the Bible. But the solutions are different. It's not man-made change. It's God-powered change that will bring nature into what it was meant to be and the climate to what God intends it to be. But why is nature in the state that it is? It's, it's red in tooth and claw. In the Northern Territory, I, I learnt that small fish eat insects. The barramundi eat the small fish and the crocodile eat the barramundi. Why is nature red in tooth and claw? And look around. Even in the most beautiful places, there's change and decay. Well, we need to go back to Genesis because when Adam and Eve sinned, sin affected everything. It affected their relationship with God. It affected their relationship with each other. And nature was subjected to a curse. God said, the ground is cursed because of you. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. And the solution to this curse on nature is not man-made solutions. Because one day, nature will be released from its curse and enjoy the glorious freedom and fruitfulness of a new heaven and a new earth. And we're given a hint of this in Colossians 1.20 when it said, God was pleased through Christ to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, the healing of nature begins at the cross and will be completed at the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now in hymn 105 verse 3 in the Baptist hymnal, you will hear these words. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infect the ground. He comes to make his Blessings flow far as the curse is found. What hymn is that? Joy to the world. The blessings of the cross come not only to us, but flow on to nature and will be ultimately healed and glorified at the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessings of Christ on the cross is to bring change, renewal, and ultimate glory. Praise be to God. Here is your future glory. Here is our hope. And this was written to a church which was less than 1% of the population, which was persecuted and restricted. And Paul says, compare your sufferings with the future glory. In verse 18 he says, I consider the sufferings of this present age not worth, not worth comparing with the glory that is going to come in the revelation of Christ. Imagine an old set of scales. On the one side, you have a gold brick. On the other side, you have some feathers. The gold brick will outweigh the feathers any day. 
as like our sufferings are just like those feathers compared to future glory. And no matter what suffering you may be going through, it might be suffering because you are a Christian. It might be physical pain. It might be the limitations of old age. It might be emotional turmoil. It might be opposition and rejection. Take heart. Your future glory outweighs all of those, those sufferings put together. Praise be to God for his great work through the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to bring glory to us and to nature and we will see the glory of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we are not worthy of any of the glory that you are going to bring to each heart and soul. But it's your love and your will that you want each one to be glorified and to be like Jesus. And Lord God, we thank you that you are at work constantly changing us from glory to glory. And Lord, may we all look forward to that wonderful day when we will see the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. Amen.